Hi, I'm Janie. Hi, I'm Ellie. We are graduate students in counseling psychology at the University of Central Oklahoma. Today we're going to talk to you about parent management training as it pertains to children with oppositional defiant disorder. So the content of this training video will consist of um, us sharing with you what exactly is parent management training, its goals, how is oppositional defiant disorder um, diagnosed as it pertains to the DSM-5, as well as a detailed breakdown of sessions 1 through 18. Before we dive into parent management training and what that consists of, we want to give you a little bit of a background on oppositional defiant disorder, particularly how it is diagnosed within the DSM-5. So oppositional defiant disorder, or known as ODD, is within the section of the DSM as disruptive, impulsive control, and conduct disorder. There's multiple criteria points that this child or teenager needs to meet in order to receive this diagnosis. One would be patterns of angry or irritable move, mood, argumentative, defiant behavior, or vindictiveness that lasts within six months or more and is exhibited in an interaction with one or more individuals other than a sibling. This disturbance in behavior um, needs to cause distress to the individual or those in their immediate social context, including family, peer group, or colleagues. It also will negatively impact important areas of, of functioning, such as social environments, peer groups, school, work, etc. Additionally, these behaviors do not co-occur um, with any psychotic or substance use disorder or another disorder that can better explain the behavior over ODD. And, if, and then there is a specify, um, specifier for the severity of mild, moderate, or severe. Mild would consist of one setting, moderate, behaviors are shown in two or more settings, and severe in three or more settings. Next in the DSM-5, we look at prevalence and risk and prognostic features. We see in children that ODD is more common in males than females, but we do not have any consistent rates in adolescents or adults. Um, the average prevalence is 3.3%, and as far as environmentally, we see a lot of ODD with you know, blended families, people who are growing up in a harsh and neglectful environment, or with parents who are inconsistent in their parenting practices. Um, and also a lot of the features are genetic and physiological. Next, we look at cultural and comor comorbidity. So it is consistent across countries and children and adolescents, so we don't see a lot of difference there. Uh, generally, we see it in low socioeconomic status, the environment of unsafe neighborhoods, violence in the home, and when parents are modeling poor behavior um, or peers and caregivers. Um, also, ODD is highly comorbid with ADHD, social anxiety disorder, and conduct disorder. So in parent management training, the ultimate goal is to decrease the defiant or oppositional behavior in the child or teen. So primary, primarily what we will use is operate conditioning and looking at the social learning theory. Those are the main theories that are involved in parent management training. There's overall 18 different sessions. The first nine, we will actually meet with the parent alone and make sure that they are mentally fit, they can gain the confidence, and then they are ready to work on different homework and different activities with the child at home before on the last 10 through 18 sessions, they'll actually bring the child or the teenager in and we'll all work together. So different methods um, are used within the session. So that'll, it'll be a mix of one-on-one -on -one with, the, with the parent or caregiver and the therapist, one-on-one -on -one with the therapist and the child, or all of us all together. There will also be videos, different training, um, worksheets and handouts, as well as different homework assignments that we will be able to go um, over and actually do in session, and then of course out of session with the caregiver and the child um, in the home. Some of the goals 
that we're going to be looking at with parent management training are, and we'll go into these in much greater detail when we start talking about individual sessions, but the first one, psychoeducation on defiant behavior and underlying treatment, um, improvement of parental management skills and competence for the child's non-compliant behavior, um, to be able to improve the child's cooperation with personal directives and requests and rules, and hopefully this will also go into the school setting as well. One of the most important is to increase family harmony and to increase problem-solving skills and communication. That is key in this, in this training. And again, we'll talk more about this, but we want to alter the child and parents' unreasonable beliefs. So within session one, the therapist and the parent will go over the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria as what Janie and I just went, we just went over in detail for a no DD child or a teen. Now in session two, um, we're gonna be looking at different, um, different models of the teen's behavior. So where could this be stemming from or what can maybe help explain their defiant behavior a little bit better? So what is the characteristic of the child or the teen themselves? So how, how were they when they were an infant? How were they kind of growing up or um, to the point where they are now? Or parent characteristic, characteristics, what are, what are the personalities of the parent? So, because if you have a parent um, that, is maybe, that maybe likes things a little bit more organized and orderly, that's going to clash significantly with a child that um, has oppositional defiant disorder. So what are things that the parent can control? Um, additionally, um, another factor is family stress, whether that's financial stress, perhaps legal stress, if the two parents or caregivers are parenting um, from different homes. Um, the child or adolescent may not be aware of these particularly, but they, that, but they are things that affect that child directly. Um, another one is parenting style. So how is the parent or caregiver responding to that child after they've been defiant or argumentative, so on and so forth. So this is where we introduce behavioral management principles um, in educating the parent or caregiver. Um, so this can be something as simple as kind of the ABCs. Right, so the antecedent, so what is happening, what is the event before the behavior, then the actual behavior, that defiant or argumentative um, verbally or physically, and then what are the consequences? So are the parents just kind of giving up? Are they giving a request to this child or teen? They're not getting a response, they're not being compliant. And do they ask again, right? Increased frustration and possibly irritation with their child or teenager. And again, that child or teen is not being respondent. So what does the parent do? What's their parenting style? Do they give up and then fulfill that request that they had given to their child themselves? Do they pass on that request to another sibling? Um, again, that's where that family harmony comes into play. Um, so one question that um, is definitely important to ask the parent or caregiver is, um, do you have enough energy to follow through with that? So if you said you need your child to do A and the consequence was B, are you ready to take the time to provide that consequence or um, um, respond to that behavior appropriately? So those are the main things that are covered within sessions one or two. Psychoeducation in session one and then um, discussing different models of the teen or child's misbehavior and also looking at principal management um, principal behavioral management um, in session two. So for sessions three, four, and five, the primary focus is on developing parental attending skills and just positive attention. So within positive attention, um, the parents need to be focused on giving one-on-one -on -one time. So this one-on-one -on -one time with their child or teen is not necessarily them teaching them something. It's whatever the child or teen's interest is, the parent is actively engaged in, um, but not asking questions, because that may come off as judgmental. Um, you know, sometimes with children. 
So a prime example of this is if the child is, you know, playing with their toys. You're just, you're sitting there and you're spending one-on-one -on -one time with them. You're making comments um, about the toy or comments to them, um, but you're not asking questions or you're not being negative, of course, in any manner. And then with a teen, an example of the one-on-one -on -one time would be um, watching them play video games or just being in the presence with them um, without without harping on them, right? Because they've, they've probably been used to not doing things right and by showing that oppositional behavior. So this is just giving them positive attention and something that they're generally interested in. And this one-on-one -on -one time can last, um, generally it's recommended for about 15 minutes. And during this one-on-one -on -one time, you don't, you don't want to bring attention to some of those minor misbehaviors. So um, teaching the parent or the caregiver to ignore some of those. So if the p child or teen does, um, um, does exhibit some minor misbehavior, the parent is to maybe turn away or ignore that particular behavior, and then when that um, behavior stops from that child or teen, then the attention is brought back to, to, that, to that child. Now, of course, if it's a major um, a, a, um, defiant behavior like hitting or you know physical contact, then those behaviors need to be addressed. And so this is something, the one-on-one -on -one time, this positive attention is something that the parent or caregiver is doing with the child. It's never considered to be a reward. So if the child, de child does do something, this is a reward. This is just something to work into the daily um, and then weekly schedule, scheduling time with, with your child or team. Um, additionally, praise in session four is introduced. And this is, you're giving verbal praise, um, you know, great job on doing this, excellent job job on completing your homework, thank you for, you know, thank you for passing the salt, little things like that, um, but you're giving them that verbal praise. So the main praises or main verbal attention that they will be getting is going to be in the absence of common misbehaviors. So at breakfast time, if that defiant child or teen normally pushes that sibling or plays with their food or something like that um, and they don't do that, that is an opportunity for you to give verbal praise. So you're giving this verbal praise in the absence of very common misbehaviors um, and also setting the stage for spontaneous compliance. So this is when you are kind of setting the environment or setting them up to respond in a positive way or, to, or exhibit a desired behavior and then give them that verbal reinforcement, that verbal praise. So if you're at the dinner table and normally the child um, doesn't engage with others or doesn't um, you know, engage with you or, or another sibling, you can ask them, you know, such and such, can you please pass the pepper? And when they comply, you know, something simple, then you give them that verbal praise. So you're really setting up different environments or different events um, to give them that verbal reinforcement. Then within session five, you move on to um, contingency management. So for session six and session seven, it's really gonna be focused on completing that contract, behavioral contract with the teenager, and completing the point systems for um, the younger teen and then child. Um, so as we have brought up and discussed in session five with the behavioral contract or the point system, it's um, setting out the do behaviors, what the parent or caregiver does want the child to do. So if it's completing homework, getting along with the sibling, um, doing chores, so on and so forth. So these are do behaviors. So in session six, this is where we're going to be focusing on the don't behaviors in which there's going to be a consequence if the child um, conducts in a way or conducts their behavior in you know, a defining or oppositional way. So this is where we um, incorporate either penalties or fines. So fines would be used um, with the point systems for the 13 year old or younger in which if they engage in a behavior um, that they know they're not supposed to, so the, do, the don't behaviors, or if they fail to do a do behavior, as discussed earlier, a fine is incorporated. So that'll be worth a certain amount of points. Um, and it's important that those, those behaviors, the, do, the don't behaviors, the do not behaviors, are actually prioritized. So we know if it, they do not complete their homework, that is four points. Um, if they don't um, put their 
dish in the sink, for example, that's one point. So you, you know the the priority level or how much each, each of those are, is worth to the child. And then of course penalties is along the same lines of um, what is the penalty or what will be a punishment for that teenager if they do not follow that behavioral contract. So for example, if they did not finish their homework um, for that day or they did not you know, read their school book they're supposed to for that one hour duration, whatever is involved um, in detail on that behavioral contract, then they will have another chore added onto the list so and so forth. And this is really an important time for, for the parent to, at, at home, so part of their homework is to show, to show their child or show their teen when they do those behaviors that, that that is put into the do not behaviors or that is what will be considered a penalty or fine. So they don't establish, establish this in session and they go home and immediately start um, putting it um, into a, into effect. So this gives an opportunity for the po child and parent um, together to identify those don't behaviors or identify what could happen if um, the penalty or fines would be um, used if that child does not engage in particular behavior. So giving them a one week span to really know concretely what the parent means and make sure it is specific. Um, so that's very important for the child and the parent to understand. Um, and then of course, in more in session seven, we're bringing that back, we're finding those different do not behaviors or those particular penalties. Because one, maybe reinforcement or penalty that they may think would be effective with their child or teen is actually not, it is actually not, excuse me. So you're really refining that. Um, and one thing within parent management training um, that the manual really kind of warns the parents about is something called emotional blackmail. Um, and it sounds very serious and it's it's something that the, the child will say kind of uh, not unknowingly but they will say um, almost kind of in retaliation of if a penalty would be is inflicted upon or some of these do not behaviors are re are reinforced talked about so that could be something as if you know something severe as you know I hate you mom I hate you dad for doing this um, or you're ruining my life you know different things like that it can be really hurtful to that parent or caregiver but it, the parent and caregiver um, it is important that they need to stay strong with this they still need to follow through right so from the very beginning do I have enough energy to follow through with what we had laid out it within the point system or within that behavioral contract so just to be aware of that and then of course to address in session seven any issues or refinements that need to take place um, within that point system and behavioral contract. So for session eight, the primary topic is grounding. Um, so at the beginning of the session, you will cover any struggles and of course any successes that the parent or caregiver has had at the point system and behavioral contract. But then the primary focus of session eight is grounding. Um, so most of us are familiar with, you know, parents, if, if the child does engage in opposition or, or you know, defiant type behavior or you know, or it's too argumentative or talking back, so to speak. Um, a lot of times a parent will say, you know, you're grounded for a week. And sometimes that grounding can mean they can't leave the house, but yet they can have all their electronics, all their toys, so and so forth. Or perhaps you're grounded, but oh, we have soccer practice or a school activity. So they're really not grounded. So this is really kind of honing in and defining better of how to properly use grounding. So grounding is used for more of the severe um, oppositional uh, behavior, whether that's physical contact with the sibling, so on and so forth. And it's recommended that grounding should only be anywhere from two hours um, up to up to two days. So it really depends on the age and then at the parents or caregiver's discretion. And this is to keep it, you know, immediate to to that child or teen, especially if the child or teen has ADHD and congruent with ODD. Um, if, if you ground the child or the, or the teenager for a week, they may forget why they were originally grounded in the first place. Or, you know, it may not be practical to, to take away certain privileges or take away um, certain things for a whole week's time, um, especially in 
in today's world with all the different activities and so on and so forth. So they normally want to keep it between two to three hours and up to two days. And it's very important that the parents or the caregivers are able to be there to monitor so that the child or teen isn't you know, sneaking out with friends or using a computer, but they're actually there and reinforcing the grounding what they have set in place. You know, again, that goes back. Do you have the energy to follow through? Does this parent have that energy to follow through with the penalty consequence and now the grounding um, for these behaviors? So it may come off a little strict, a little stern, but it's really helping to shape um, that teen or that child's behavior. So in session nine, remember this is the last session with the parent or the caregiver alone, one-on-one -on -one with the therapist. So um, first and foremost, this is an opportunity to spend a little bit more time on um, any of the topics of the last session, whether that's you know, even the one-on-one -on -one time with positive attention and praise, the behavioral contracts or point systems, um, and then lastly with grounding. So they're there does need to be an adjustment of time or of focus. This is the time to do it. You know, and this is um, this, it's important to go at the parent's pace, and that's okay to be flexible um, because most importantly, we, we need to make sure it's being effective and that the parent or caregiver sees the value in it. Uh, but if it does go on track per session to session, um, session nine is the last one that you have one-on-one -on -one with the parent, as I mentioned before, and this one is primarily focused on school advocacy. So it addresses any, any um, any concerns related to school. So do I need to contact the school counselor or the principal or the teacher specifically? So what measures need to be put in place? Does there need to be a point system or even a behavioral contract that is detailed um, that needs to be put in place and gone over with the t teacher themselves so that they're aware of what's going on at home and what you are trying to accomplish? Because um, they're at school a lot of most of the day, a lot of the time. So it needs to be something that is um, transferred and useful within the within the school environment. So this is the opportunity to do so and also to know what um, legally what the different options are for that child and that parent if needed. And again, reviewing um, what has happened, the successes, maybe go over some of the struggles, but giving them a lot of praise from sessions one through nine and even making it this far because it's been a lot of work and it's been a lot of time. So this is the opportunity to wrap up any last minute questions from the one-on-one -on -one, um, before moving forward and incorporating that child or teen into therapy. As Ellie said, session 10 begins the second half of the program, which becomes family training, and the child will be incorporated into the sessions. When you begin with the child in session, it's going to be very important that you reestablish rapport with the child since you haven't seen them since the initial intake. And they know that you've been working with their parents for quite a while now, and they may see you as the person who's trying to teach their parents how to control them or something. So that just taking some time to redevelop rapport is going to be very important when starting this process. Session 10 begins problem solving and communication training. Explain to everyone that parent-child conflict is usually over specific issues and they're mo mostly verbal arguments. So. These sessions will focus on how members, family members talk with one another when they're in conflict. The principles of problem solving include gradually increasing independence. So as this program goes along, you're going to want to be very involved with the family in the beginning, really helping them to understand these techniques because eventually when they're at home, you want them to be able to do them by themselves. So as the further you go along, just continue to pull back and let them let them do a little more each time. Next you're going to work with them in negotiating in distinguishing negotiable and non-negotiable items within their family. So non-negotiable items are going to be kind of those bottom line rules in a family that are no violence, no drinking, no smoking, you must attend school. Um, treating one another with respect and things like that. The negotiable items 
for example, may be the child will have, maybe have a curfew, but what time that curfew is would be negotiable. So curfew is non-negotiable, but the time of the curfew is negotiable, and so on like that. It's important to involve the child in the problem-solving techniques. Explain to them that problem solving is a way for them to be involved in making decisions that will affect them, kind of helping them to just be, you know, to include themselves in this process because that's going to be very important moving forward. In this session and the next session, we will focus on maintaining good communication skills within the family as well as guiding them toward more realistic expectations. Next, we will introduce the techniques of problem solving and walk the family through them one at a time. Before you choose a problem to talk about within the family, when you're teaching them these techniques, it's best to give them a hypothetical problem so that they can focus on learning these new skills and how to do them instead of focusing on something that's very personal to them that allows them to kind of step away from it a little bit. The first step is to define the problem. So you're going to have the family talk about what they think the problem is, again using a hypothetical story, and you're going to teach them to use I statements. Explain that when you say you, it's very accusing, but when you say I feel, it sounds less threatening to a person. So you'll practice that in session. For example, a teenager may say, mom and dad, I feel embarrassed when you come in to the party to pick me up. So work on that with them and make sure that they understand that that sounds a lot better than you embarrass me when you come in to the party. There's a big difference there. So next, each person will get an opportunity to define the problem so that we make sure that everyone's on the same page um, with what exactly the problem is. The next step is to, to generate solutions. You will want the family to take turns throwing out solutions until they have maybe around 12, which in the beginning that will be very hard for them to come up with 12 so you can work with them and help them out and kind of encourage them to throw in things no matter how silly or extreme they may seem, but they'll, they'll keep working until they, they generate around 12 solutions. And then after they've come up with the solutions, they're going to evaluate them. So each family member will have a chance to look at the solutions that they've proposed and put a plus mark by the ones they think are good or doable, and then a minus mark with ones that they just don't think that are, will work at all. And next they'll select the option that is most agreeable to all of them. Hopefully there will be one that is mostly agreeable to all of them, but if there's none, you can kind of work with them in negotiating a compromise. So after you've selected the option that's most agreeable to everyone, you're going to develop a plan to implement the goals. This includes who will do what, when, where, um, who will monitor the compliance of the, of the plan, and exactly what does compliance and non-compliance look like, um, and target unforeseen difficulties um, with the agreement that they've made with one another. And the last step is to, to evaluate the implementation. So after the family goes home and has a week or two to practice the solution, they can determine whether or not it's working for them um, or if they need to, to redefine it. The next two sessions will continue to focus on the problem solving techniques. It's a new theory to the parents, it's a new practice, it's going to take a lot of practice for them to get used to this model and this process. So you'll continue to check in with them, you'll choose a low intensity problem for the family to work on of their own, and then we're going to gradually increase to a higher intensity problem so that they can really 
get these new skills down. Um, and you're still at this point very involved in working with the family and trying to get them to learn these new um, new processes. So it'll be important to discuss what's happening at home, congratulate them on successes they've had, and and work with them in helping with any problems that they've had. So just be encouraging if they're struggling and and really kind of hone in on what the problems are so you can continue to help them in the next couple sessions work through those. Sessions 13 and 14 will introduce the family to communication skills training, as well as continuing their, to develop their expertise in problem solving. Um, so the first thing you're going to do is introduce them to the three principles of good communication. The first one is listen when your child or parent is in the mood to talk. Do not try to get the, them to open up if they're not in the mood. Um, it's especially true for adolescents. They may go weeks or months without wanting to open up and communicate. So when they're in the mood, it's going to be very important for the parents to stop what they're doing and listen to them and be available, available to them at those times. Next, we're going to talk about using active listening and encouraging the child or parent to, to express their feelings and opinions. So you're going to, in session, guide them through the process and show them what active listening looks like. Just engage them in conversation and have the other person paraphrase what the other person said without putting a lot of feeling into it. And then the third is you're going to talk with the family about the, the importance of being honest with their feelings, whether, whether they're good or bad, um, expressing how they feel. and doing it in a way that is not hurtful to the listener. That's, that'll be very important. And then after you introduce those three things, you'll talk to them about how to recognize negative communication habits and guide them toward alternative positive replacement behaviors. You'll continue to practice all of these skills the family has learned so far. You'll continually be increasing in into a more intense problem that ha that occurs within the family um, and then work through it using these skills so far session 15 focuses on unrealistic beliefs and expectations after a parent has lived with a defiant teen for many years, they begin to move toward thinking toward the worst. And they may think that the more freedom they give their child, inevitably they're going to make a poor decision and ruin the rest of their life. And then when a child makes a mistake, the parent is going to tend to think that they did it on purpose. Other real, realistic expectations may be that the parent expects the children, the child, to just love and appreciate everything that they that the parent does for them. And this is not only rare, but it's very unnatural for an adolescent to do something like this. So we really need to get them to be able to recognize um, the difference between reasonable and unreasonable beliefs and expectations. Extreme thinking can add fuel to the fire for defiant behavior and considerably worsen conflict within the family. And teenagers and adolescents have their extreme thoughts as well. For example, they may think that parent rules are just plain unfair and we'll get them to be able to recognize those. Or 
an adolescent may believe that they should have complete freedom from uh, their parents' restrictions um, and complete autonomy. So when addressing unbelievable beliefs and expectations, um, you will help the family members to identify when this is happening, identify an extreme thought. After you go through the process with them and help them to do that, then you'll provide a logical challenge to the extreme thought. Help the member identify a more reasonable belief or a more realistic thought. Next, you're going to help the family member collect evidence to disconfirm the extreme thought and to confirm the more reasonable one. And being able to see these side by side, the differences, they'll be able to begin to recognize this more on their own. Sessions 16 and 17 are more practice in everything that the family has learned so far, um, with an emphasis on being able to catch their unbelie uh, unreasonable beliefs. Um, you'll now be working with a high intensity problem with the family, so the therapist will be kind of standing back, but will also need to be pointing out all the positive strides that have been made within the family. Because as we get toward the end of the program, it's going to be important to know any roadblocks that are standing in their way when they're not in the therapist office. Because um, we're down to the last sessions and hopefully the family is handling the discussion as much as possible. Um, and the therapist is only having to intervene a little bit. So still practicing from the very beginning the problem solving skills the communication skills and now just adding on the, the catching unreasonable beliefs session 18 it's your last session with the family so this is the time to review any problems that need to be addressed anything the family is having difficulty with at home, anything that you can do to kind of help them do this process by themselves, this is the time to address them. Then you will again review all the main major components of the whole program. Um, you're gonna want to ask the family for feedback on the program, ask anything they wanna tell you just for feedback to make some changes in the future if needed and also just let them know that if they encounter difficulties or want to check in with you in another month or so just to see how it's going and then after they've really had time to implement these skills um, they'll kind of know what the problems are and they'll know maybe what they need to come in and talk about just congratulate them on on completing the program and that's it Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you gain some valuable information on what is parent management training and how to effectively use it for an oppos oppositional defiant um, teen or child. If you wait till the end of the video, right now the references sheet should be popping up and you can see a lot of empirically based articles and also the manual that we used when producing this video. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.